My name is Justin Dye, and I'm one of the neurosurgeons at Loma Linda University. Today I'm going to be talking about the management of cranial dural arteriovenous fistulas. I have no disclosures related to this talk. In this brief talk, I'll be describing what a dural arteriovenous fistula is, how they present, and where they commonly occur. We'll discuss how to classify dural AVFs, when to observe and when to treat. Lastly, I'll talk about modern treatment strategies. Essentially, a cranial dural arteriovenous fistula is an abnormal connection between arteries and veins of the brain. One key difference between AV fistulas and AV malformations is that AVFs are typically acquired lesions that form sometime later in life, while AVMs are congenital lesions usually present since birth. Another difference is that while AVMs have a nidus with multiple abnormal connections between arteries and veins, AV fistulas may only have a single abnormal arteriovenous connection, which we call the fistula site or fistula sac. In this lateral ICA injection, you can see the telltale sign of an abnormal arteriovenous shunt, which is a pacification of the venous system in the arterial phase, uh, also known as early venous drainage. Patients will always ask, what caused the fistula? And the answer most times is we don't know, since many dural AVFs are idiopathic. However, we believe some of the risk factors for fistula formation include prior craniotomy, head trauma, and venous sinus thrombosis. There is an association between patients who form AV fistulas and those with an underlying hypercoagulable disorder, such as deficiencies in antithrombin, protein C, or protein S. Symptoms related to dural AV fistulas primarily depend on the location of the fistula itself. Common symptoms include pulsatile tinnitus in patients with transverse sigmoid sinus junction AVFs, and carotid cavernous fistulas can present with the classic triad of ophthalmoplegia, proptosis, and chemosis. Intracranial hemorrhage with subsequent neurologic deficit is many times the presenting symptom of higher grade fistulas. However, it's important to keep in mind that dural AV fistulas can present with more nonspecific findings, such as progressively worsening cognitive decline. This is primarily due to venous hypertension from arteriovenous shunting and is often difficult to diagnose as non-vascular imaging can show nothing more than signs of white matter disease. When there is a high level of suspicion for an underlying dural AV fistula, the best screening studies are dynamic CTA or MRA and catheter-based cerebral angiography remain, remains the gold standard. The most common locations for dural AV fistulas of the brain include the transverse sigmoid sinus junction, as you can see on this left-sided panel, followed by the, by the cavernous sinus, or CC fistulas, uh, which you can see here shown on the right. The superior sagittal sinus is another common location for AV fistula formation. And a less common location, but still clinically important, is the anterior cranial fossa dural AV fistula, which is usually fed by ethmoidal branches of the ophthalmic artery, which you can see here. The two most common classification systems for dural AV fistulas are the Coneyard and Borden grading scales. Here I'm showing the cone yard classification system, which is a bit busy uh, and I won't read through all of it. But the most important distinction in the presence of cortical is the presence of cortical venous reflux, also described as cortical venous drainage. The reason this is important is because dural AV fistulas without cortical venous drainage usually have a benign clinical course, while AVFs with cortical venous drainage have a significantly higher risk of hemorrhage and or neurologic deficit and therefore warrant treatment. It's also important to keep in mind that lower grade dural AV fistulas can go on to develop high grade features and therefore should be monitored over time. Keeping that in mind, the indications for treatment of dural AV fistulas is pretty straightforward. Uh, type 2B or greater fistulas, those that do have cortical venous drainage, have a significant annual risk of hemorrhage or even non-hemorrhagic neurologic deficit and therefore treatment should be recommended as the risk of treatment is generally lower than the natural history risk. Type 1 or 1A fistulas, those that do not have cortical venous drainage, can usually be monitored with serial imaging and symptom follow-up. 
However, some low-grade fistulas can cause debilitating symptoms, such as severe pulsatile tinnitus, and in these select cases, treatment can be considered. Cranial dural AV fistulas are some of the most complex lesions we treat, as you can see in this ECA injection. However, the goal of treatment is simple. That goal is to block the fistula site. As you can see in this very simplified drawing, there can be multiple arteries connecting to one fistula sac with a large draining vein, which many times is a venous sinus. Unlike in an AV malformation where each abnormal arteriovenous connection must be carefully closed and divided and the night is completely removed, in an AV fistula, blocking the fistula site is enough to stop the pathologic process. Nowadays, this is commonly done by endovascular treatment, either through the arteries, also known as transarterial embolization, or through the veins, called transvenous embolization. The first step in treating any cranial dural AV fistula is a complete cerebral angiogram, including selective intracranial and, ex and extracranial injections. Here you can see an ICA injection on the left with a tentorial branch off the cavernous segment that supplies this transverse sigmoid sinus junction fistula. It's a little faint, but here's a tentorial artery uh, coming off of the ICA that supplies a transverse sigmoid sinus junction fistula. On the right is an ECA injection showing the same fistula fed primarily by a distal branch of the MMA. And here's that MMA branch going to the fistula with early venous drainage into the sigmoid sinus. The next step is to get as close to the fistula site as you can with your microcatheter. This point can't be overemphasized as this gives you the best chance to shut down the fistula completely as opposed to a more proximal embolization that has a high risk of residual or recurrent arterial feeders. In general, we choose to approach the fistula through ECA branches when possible, since the risk of neurologic deficit is lower than with ICA branches. And you can see in this case, we used the MMA to reach the fistula site. The last step is to deliver uh, the embolic material, which can be MBCA glue, onyx type material, or even coils, especially in transverse uh, transvenous approaches. The main tip I would give here is to be patient with your embolization material, as this approach usually leads to complete obliteration of the fistula. And here you can see uh, onyx that we used in this fistula to completely obliterate it. One common location for transvenous embolization is with carotid cavernous fistulas. This is a patient with a left-sided direct CC fistula from trauma. And again, we, we are starting with a complete angiogram showing cross-filling of the, of the fistula through the ACOM as well as through the PCOM. Having this information ahead of time allows uh, for the possibility of vessel sacrifice if necessary. And here is the left ICA injection, which shows essentially no contrast flow above the level of the cavernous sinus. With the catheter remaining in the left ICA, we then bring up another guide catheter through the right internal jugular vein and use a microcatheter to access the fistula site through the inferior petrosal and inner cavernous sinuses. And here you can see that approach. And this just shows the final position of the microcatheter in the left cavernous sinus, which in this case is the fistula site. We then inflate a balloon in the left ICA in order to prevent any embolic material getting into the carotid through the tear in the artery, and then start to deploy detachable coils using the microcatheter in the cavernous sinus. Here's our balloon in the left ICA, and then we start to deploy detachable coils through the intercavernous sinus and that microcatheter in the left cavernous sinus. And after the fistula is blocked, there is restoration of normal contrast flow into the intracranial vessels. Keep in mind that surgery is still an option in fistulas that can't be reached through an endovascular route. And in some locations, surgery is actually favored when the endovascular route has a high risk of neurologic deficit. 
such as the case in anterior cranial fossa fistulas that are primarily fed by distal branches of the ophthalmic artery, where reflux of an embolic material can block the central retinal artery and lead to monocular blindness. And here you can see on a CTA, the telltale signs of dilated veins near the cribriform plate um, in this anterior cranial fossa duralevi fistula, again, fed by distal branches of the ophthalmic artery. One way to approach these fistulas is through a unilateral low anterior frontal craniotomy. The fistula site lays along the cribriform plate, which can be uh, accessed subfrontally with good brain relaxation. One key to keep in mind with this approach is what to do with the frontal sinus, which may have to be opened uh, given the low anterior access that is needed. Once the fistula is identified, it simply needs to be coagulated and divided. Interoperative ICG with the microscope can be helpful to confirm complete obliteration of the fistula. So remember that cranial dural AV fistulas can present with nonspecific symptoms, and in patients with unexplained cognitive decline, you may want to consider dynamic non-invasive imaging. Dural AV fistulas with cortical venous drainage or reflux have a significant annual risk of hemorrhage and or neurologic deficit, and intervention should be offered to these patients. A multidisciplinary approach is best with a team that can offer transarterial, transvenous, combined endovascular, and open surgical approaches to the patient. And lastly, don't forget to do a complete angiogram to fully understand the neurovascular anatomy of these sometimes complex lesions. Thank you.